So we're going to start today's meeting, which is a hybrid meeting on Zoom and in person. And we're really, really excited about the in person part because we've been doing Zoom. So um, this is very exciting. Welcome to the North Carolina Native Plant Society Southern Piedmont chapter meeting. My name is Beth Davis. I'm the Southern Piedmont chapter co-chair along with Lisa Tompkins. So now for the September meeting of the North Carolina Native Plant Society, let me introduce our speaker, Mark Warren. Mark is the owner of the Medicine Bow Wilderness School in Dahlonega, Georgia, and has been teaching nature and survival skills <laughs> to adults and children for more than 45 years. And uh, we are really excited to hear all of the things and as we are out. lovers of native plants, it warms us to see the growing respect that, that communities are beginning to have of the First Nations people, including the Cherokee, our native Catawba Nation, and um, we hope to hear more from you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for coming today, too. Uh, my name is Mark, so please call me that. I would like to enrich this program with a little back and forth, if you're so inclined. So if you have a question during the program, please raise your hand so I can see you and uh, we'll, we'll cover that. Okay. S scared somebody at home, no doubt. <laughs> uh, I have a, a love of wilderness. I, I've had it since I was a child and it's fairly unexplainable because my family did not engage in anything outdoors other than golf perhaps. And uh, yet I just had a, a driving need to be in the forest. And that's where I went every chance I got. And I'm grateful that I had a, a very good mother who trusted me to do that, to spend time alone like that. Uh, even when I became a, an early teenager, she allowed me to hitchhike to the mountains because once I discovered the mountains, I was hooked. I, I was love struck really. And that's where I live now. So I'm in the central area of North Georgia where I have a school called Medicine Bow. And there I teach the survival skills of the Cherokee and basic nature classes. What I wanna share with you today are some of the plants that you can still easily find in your surrounding woods to explain to you how the Cherokees use them. Now, someone's gonna ask this question eventually, so I'm gonna just go ahead and start off with this. How did these people learn these uses of plants? How did they learn all the intricate practicalities of medicines, which plants were foods, which were poisonous? And the answer to that is one that is sometimes hard to swallow by the public. But here's where the anthropologists will tell you now. All paleo people, all of them, not just Native Americans, but your ancestors included, all of us have ancestors who were born into this world with the instincts included in their hereditary material. That seems almost too fantastic to believe, but wild animals still enjoy that right now. And so if you need proof of that, there it is. One reason it's so difficult to believe is because of how much we've lost. It is said that as a culture gets more and more refined, especially with language, that's when we begin to lose all those original instincts that connected us more intimately with nature. You ever heard the word atavism? Atavism? It's a resurfacing of something ancient from your own people in you in a modern time. I see that when kids come to my school and <clears throat> pile out of a bus and I have a gravel lot and suddenly my gravel lot becomes ammunition <laughs> and every tree becomes a target. It's the most natural thing in the world, especially for little boys because they come from a hunting tradition. But we all experience some things like that, whether we know it or not. Before there was language, most of the communication between people, early people, 
was done through facial expressions, posture, movements perhaps, and very importantly, through pheromones, chemicals that waft through the air. We still have them, but we've lost the ability to consciously read them. I've chosen about, uh, I think, nine or 10 easy to encounter plants because I really want you to make use of something. And here's why. When you use a plant as a medicine, or if you use one as a food, or to make some kind of tool that you need, you have begun an investment in a friendship between you and that individual plant. There's an intimacy there that is not had any other way. And the manner in which you do it cements that relationship. The manner in which the Native Americans, the Cherokees here I'm talking about more specifically, was very important to them, how they approached plants and how they used them and how they treated them. For example, there was an actual formula that was followed by approaching a plant from a certain direction, circling it a certain number of times before taking a part of that plant and always respected percentages of individual plants or parts of the plant were used so as not to overwhelm, not to devastate an area and to lose the use of that plant. We begin with fire. This may be the best magic trick I know, creating fire with the bare hands. Um, it's one of the best ways to capture a group's attention, that's for sure. <laughs> but when you engage in this, <clears throat> in the early days of this, <clears throat> it's quite a difficult task. It takes a lot of stamina. It takes a lot of upper body strength and some uh, agility and coordination to keep <clears throat> the parts in the correct position. The beauty of the very first way that fire was created, probably, nobody knows for sure, but most probably, it was done by the hand drill, and it takes only three items. A drill to spin with your hands, a piece of board you could think of as a plank, it's basically referred to as the hearth, and it will receive the spin of the drill, which is powered by the hands. And you also need something that will actually burst into flame. So a flattened out piece of tinder could be placed under this. Let me tell you a brief little humor story about my introduction to this. I love the idea of going into something without knowing how to do it and just pretending like I'm the first man trying it out. And I have more failures than you can imagine. <laughs> but every failure helps me as a teacher. It also helps me to respect the process of the person who did finally perfect the skill. Take a look at this board. You can see where the drill has been spinning. Here's one of these divots where that's all it's been doing, spinning right there. But the next step is to cut this notch that you see here. So each of these is an individual fire making place. That notch turns out to be all important. And I didn't know anything about a notch. So I spent two months every night trying to make fire with something like this. And as I spun, hot ash rose to the top because there's really nowhere else it can go. It's little pieces of wood that are taken off of this hardened winter weed. This happens to be mullein, which is not native, but it could be horse weed, which is, or it could be evening primrose, which is. It tears off little tiny pieces of drill and hearth and brings them up to the top where they cool off quickly. You can get a very good pile of smoking ash, but try to pour that into a pile of tinder and it's too cool. So I went to a library, I surrendered, went to a library, <laughs> looked in a book and I learned about this beautiful notch that someone figured out long ago. The notch invades right into the bowl shape so that ash can fall down into it. It falls right into the tinder, and then it can be blown into a flame. It's a beautiful process to watch, and it changes a life 
when someone figures out how to do it because you realize you can walk out into the forest with your bare hands and create fire. That's almost Merlin-like to me. And fire, of course, has so many applications. Cooking food, just keeping warm, making medicines, crafting tools so that you can bend wood by melting the glue inside wood with heat and then holding it bent until it cools so that it remains in that shape. You see the little open space below the fire? Anybody who knew what they were doing making fire in the old days created that little shelf like that so that they could put their burning ball of tinder into there. Now there's a beautiful poetic phrase that the native people use for those trees from which you can make fire. In this area, we have a little less than 30. And that's including some non-native species that exist here now. No one has been able to put a finger on how you describe a type of tree that you can create fire from. These days, you simply have to experiment and figure it out or go to a book and look at the list to see what's possible to make fire. The human body is just not strong enough to make fire with something like, say, oak. And yet, sycamore is. And you would think that would be just as difficult. And hickory, you can make fire with. Here's what the native people called it. Those trees that make fire, they were called the trees that swallowed fire in the ancient day. And the thought was that if you know the technique and deal with that piece of wood, it will give fire back to you. And you know, it literally did swallow fire, didn't it? Photons of energy from the sun, and it's all stored into the wood. And what we do is release it with friction. There are only a few pine trees that you can do this with. And one of them is the white pine. This is one of the sacred trees of the Cherokee. The Cherokee don't tend to share the rationale behind why a tree is on the list of sacred trees. But they will never burn them as firewood. White pine is one. Shortleaf pine is another. And the third one is hemlock. Those three pines will create fire. Whenever I first set out to establish a fire for a campsite or for making some medicine, whatever it is, this is where I go first, to the white pine. You can see in this photo that many of the branches that exist there, and this is the lower part of the tree, they're dead. There's some tiny twigs in there that are absolutely dead, but still very firm, very crisp, and hanging on to the trunk. And therefore, it's as if they are attached to a drying rack. They're off the ground. So this is the best place to go to get your kindling because all pine trees make a chemical called terpene. Now it sounds a little like turpentine, but it's spelled differently. Terpene is T-E-R-P-E-N-E. -E. The terpenes are highly flammable. And that's why a forest fire in a pine forest is so devastating. It's a blistering inferno. You could take from this tree one dead branch with all its many branchlets and sub branchlets and have everything you need to create the beginning of your pyre, P-Y-R-E. That's the structure that you put together of sticks, which will logically help fire to grow and grow as it reaches higher and higher and thicker elements of fuel. It's a thought out process to make a pyre. This is our only native pine that grows its limbs in whorls, W-H-O-R-L-S. And this is a whorl here. There's a whorl there. If you were looking down on it from above, it's a little like spokes of a wheel and the tree trunk is the hub. But of course, no rim for this wheel. But these grow by whorls one each year. So you can literally read the age of a white pine. It's the tallest tree in the Eastern United States. They're towering. And you cannot go anywhere in the mountains. And by the way, another name for this is mountain pine. So that's where you're gonna find it. But you cannot travel through the mountains far without encountering some dead, dry, 
white pine that you could use to create the fire. If you'd like to read the age of a white pine that you happen to know, consider this, that little seed that came down, helicopter type, and it landed. When it started to germinate, it formed a little tiny seedling. It took seven years to make its first floral. So start with seven and you have to look down low to the ground about this high and see the old scars of ancient whorls. And then that's year number seven, eight, nine. Then eventually you can see them easily and count up. You'll be surprised how old a small white pine is in your forest because it's in your forest. If it were out in a meadow like this one, it'd be much bigger. This slide reveals a layer of a tree that many people are not familiar with. It's called the inner bark. So I use this knife to make a rectangular slit through outer bark and this layer, which is called the inner bark. You can see it curled right here. The inner bark is the section of bundles in a tree that carry all the chemicals the tree sends down from the leaves to the roots. So there's that downward sap that travels in a tree. Does anybody know where we find the tubes that carry water and nutrients and minerals up the tree? It happens to be in the outermost layer of the wood. So that would be the section just beneath that inner bark. So first you've got the outer bark. That's like our skin. That's a protective layer. Then just underneath, you've got the sap carrying tubes that are hollow. They go all the way to the roots. That's the inner bark. We have five trees in this area whose inner bark is edible as a survival food. That last part is tagged on to let you know you're probably not gonna really enjoy it too much. <laughs> But listen to what's in just the white pine inner bark. Phosphorus, iron, here's the, here are three big ones. Fat, the right kind of fat. Protein, that's a huge one. Carbohydrates, of course. Then you've got riboflavin, niacin, thiamine, vitamin C in big numbers, vitamin A in big numbers. It's a rich nutrient rich layer of the tree, but it's not everything that the leaves make. The leaves send down a portion of what they make, the parts that the roots need, but the leaves keep in them another portion that they need to protect themselves. And that's why we often find toxins in the leaf. It's a smart way. And we can trust the tree absolutely to send the correct chemicals down because this inner bark, this is the source of many of the medicines that I'll be talking about today. This particular medicine with the white pine has a reputation as an expectorant. And let me tell you the formula for dosage on this. I come at this from a survival standpoint. I'm not an herbalist. I don't have an apothecary at home with lots of different uh, plant parts in it but I, I want to know how to do something right away with a plant. The general rule is that you use your little finger as your template and the outline of that, and of course, imagining that bottom line also. That's your rectangle that represents your dosage that will go in one cup of just boiled water. In other words, we're not boiling the bark, but we're steeping it just like a tea bag. Something happens chemically when you boil it. Has anyone here ever accidentally, early in your stage of life, maybe boiled a tea bag? It's terrible. It changes taste completely. But the outline of your little finger is what you should cut on a branch. And never do this on the trunk of a tree. You can see I've, I've taken a branch and I'm using a rotten log or a dead log behind it as a workbench. But uh, never do this with a trunk because you're doing too much damage to the whole organism. Doing it to a branch only does damage to that part of the tree. Now, you can probably look at that and say, well, that's 
not my outline of my little finger. Is it? What I do is twice as long and half as wide. It's the exact same dosage and it does less damage to the tree. Because the more you girdle a limb or girdle a trunk, you know what happens. With most trees, when the beaver completely girdle all the way around, that kills it. That kills the tree because you've cut away its inner bark. That's the food of the beaver, by the way. That's what they want. And uh, they're happy to have those trees come down. This is why they gnaw at trees and bring them down. You know, most people think it's for building dams. Well, imagine carrying those trees off to your dam site. They cut them down because they can't climb. And the best inner bark is at the new growth, the top and all around the edges. So once the tree is down, they have access to it. You see the little green color in there? This whole layer of inner bark is not green. That's just a one cell thick layer. And it's called, here's a word you know, the cambium. But many books get this wrong and tell you that the inner bark and the cambium are the same thing. You can see how thick the inner bark is. What we're seeing right below that, you see that bright wood there? That's the sap wood. That's what carries fluid up. But that little layer of green, that one cell thick layer is a part of the larger composite, the inner bark. And I'm gonna show you some inner bark in a little bit. So the process is, boil water, take an empty cup, cut your strip of inner bark, put it in the empty cup. When the water has boiled, pour that just boiled water over. Let it steep for about 15 minutes and it's done. It's easy. So here's the fire making process. You can see I've got a whole tree lying down on my hearth to hold it steady because that's important to keep your hearth very, very steady. I particularly like a fairly long drill. Fires can be made with drills this long, though. But this is. This long drill is a factor of my spine, which is not the best in the room. So I like to work upright more. So here we have the very beginnings. You can just see a little smoke forming right there. There's the tinder waiting. Underneath that, I've got a very thin little layer of tinder that I call the serving tray. And once I get my little pie-shaped piece of hot ash filling up that notch, I remove the hearth pick up my little serving tray and take my larger tinder and invert it all and blow it into a flame. It's a great moment when it happens that first time. One of our most common trees is called by the wrong name by most people in this world. The US Forest Service even calls it the wrong name. This is not a poplar. This is a magnolia. But you may have been taught that this is called the tulip poplar or the yellow poplar. You've even seen a book perhaps that shows a picture of this and says yellow poplar. It is wrong, it is magnolia. And let me tell you why that's important. You also have in this area five trees who have edible inner bark. Poplar is one of them. So if you think this is a poplar and you cut green inner bark off of a tree limb, and start chewing on that, swallowing that, you're gonna get a stomach ache, you'll remember, because this is not edible. This is the tulip magnolia. And it's unique because it is our only native tree, to my knowledge, that has no pointed end. In fact, it has just the opposite. Instead of a point, it's got a notch. Easy tree to identify because of that. There are plenty of them right along the, the boardwalk coming up here to the Nature Center building. Have a walk out there and later look at them. See that upside down V scar right there? You see that on some other trees too, but it's a good thing to note so that you can zero in on is that truly the tulip magnolia? Let's shorten that to the tulip tree. That's usually what I call it. That's a stipule scar. It used to be tiny. It's when a little branch first started breaking out of the trunk 
And as the tree grew and the bark stretched, the scar got a lot bigger. On the right, you see a dead branch from the tulip tree that I've just broken over my knee. And look how it's broken into three parts. That's what usually happens with this branch. And that third part right there is always the same shape. It's kind of like an elongated, maybe like an outline of a UFO. It's that brittle because it's very porous. It's a fast grower. So we make use of that by using this as a fast burning firewood when we want our power to really get energized and to flame up bigger. But because it's so porous, it makes very poor coal, so it don't last. So this would not be good for a long lasting fire once your fire is established. But look what I've exposed here. Look hanging down right there. See how that was peeled off the wood? That is the inner bark facing you right there. This branch was dead. I picked it up off the ground. And I can strip off of that right there. On the other side of that strip would be the outer bark that you're accustomed to seeing. And on the inner side, once those fibers are dead, this is what it looks like. You can see a little bit of outer bark that's gray right there. And that flakes off fairly easily. And behind, what's left behind is inner bark fibers. Every one of these tiny little hair-like fibers is hollow. This is what carries all that fluid from the leaves all the way down. So this is the easiest source of tinder in the Southeast by far, because it's such a common tree. Here's another thing that it constantly surprises me that this is not on the Cherokee's list of sacred trees because of all the gifts that it has. Here I've got just a ribbon of inner bark. Is this faucet working here? I just wet this anytime the wet fibers, you know, makes them stronger because they're more flexible or less brittle. That's all it is. Something a little philosophical on that about being willing to bend so that you don't break. I'm just going to take a little collection of it right here and show you one of the world's most important inventions. It will be done right here before your very eyes. I have never seen this mentioned in a history book, in a scholastic history book, never. But this is dead bark. It's lost all of its chemical properties. So I'm going to anchor it with a tooth. And I'm twisting a certain way. It's important to know which way, which hand twist. And then I'm going to cross over a certain way. It's important to notice which hand goes over. And now I switch. So twist until I get some tension, cross over, switch. Now I got to stop because I feel a problem. I feel this side is thicker than this side. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a little strip from the thick side and steal it, take it over to the other side. Like so. I want my two sides to be equal in bulk so that they will very evenly share this design of the double helix. This is one twist, and here's the other one. So we're creating the same shape that DNA is famous for. And we know that as a beautiful piece of architecture. Of course, you can see what I'm making now. And there's when you see this up closer, I'll, I'll pass this around. Uh, you'll see that it's a very familiar pattern here. You've seen this before because ropes are still made in this very same pattern. 
but it's not a factory with people sitting around with fibers in their mouth. Of course, it's machines. Now, watch the very end here, just so you'll you'll know about the proper ending. Put your two pieces together and treat them as one. And I'm just going to tie a simple overhand knot, the knot that everybody knows. And then I, before I really tighten it, I'm going to pull it down toward the end more. And there is one of the world's most important inventions, cordage, because this is how you attach one thing to another. So that's how the tool makers first made things stay together. Do you wet it, always wet it? It sure helps. Yeah. When I find inner bark, it can be at any stage of decomposition or lack of. And usually I have to soak it maybe a few weeks and I take it in and out of water over that period of time so that it can have some drying out time. Finally, you'll know when it's right. You'll peel it off and it'll be a beautiful ribbon just begging to be made into a piece of rope. The Cherokees had a problem with two maladies in particular. They were prone to a certain kind of skin cancer that non-Cherokees don't even get. And they were prone to stones in the body. Gallstones, bladder stones, uh, urinary tract, kidney stones. This plant, Pipsisua, also called striped wintergreen, though you will never find any whiff of wintergreen in this plant. This is one of the best medicines for dissolving a stone. The, the name itself comes from the Algonquins farther up north. A lot of the names that we know that have, have persevered throughout medicines and places, many of them are Algonquin words because that was one of the tribes that, that first encountered the, the French Canadians up in the, the Boisier area. And so a lot of first communication went on there. Pipsisua means in the Algonquin language, breaks apart the stone. So let's talk for a minute about a stone. Our forest in Southeast makes a lot of a chemical called oxalic acid. We find that uh, in wood sorrel. I bet you've tasted that before. Some people call that sour clover. Some people call it sour grass. Don't know why, but it doesn't look like a grass. We find oxalic acid in spinach. It gives spinach that little tart flavor. It's in chocolate. If anyone here has ever eaten lamb's quarters, you've had oxalic acid. Well, if you are a person who is prone to making stones, and you would know by now if you are, most of you would. If you've never made a stone in your life and you're an adult, you probably never will. But if you're someone who has to be aware of that and take care of yourself in that sense, there's a list of foods you should not eat. Because in your body, like in the Cherokees, when oxalic acid encounters free calcium, it bonds with it to form a crystal. That's called calcium oxalate. And then it just adds to it by more bonding. And that's the stone. This plant provides a tea, a simple tea to be made with the leaves. You can make tea with green leaves. It's a lot easier to do it with dried leaves. So let me talk about dried first. If you simply collected a leaf or two right here and then went to another plant and collected a leaf or two and then to another, you usually find these plants in little colonies. When you find one, make yourself stop and look around. You're probably gonna find two or three other plants there. But treat the colony with respect. Take a minimum amount from a plant. Tie them all together. Take them home. Pin a piece of yarn with those leaves connected into a doorway so that you get ventilation without direct sunlight. In two weeks, those leaves are dry. Then they're easy to measure because at that point, you crumble up one teaspoon of dried Pipsisawa leaves and put that in just boiled water to let it steep. And it diffuses quickly. 
if you're making it with green leaves, you've got more work to do because the chemicals inside the green leaf are perfectly content being in the green leaf because it's wet. So you have to actually mash it out. You have to use some kind of blunt ended tool to mash out the chemicals and you work at it and work at it and work at it. It might take 20 minutes of just crushing to get all that you need out of it. And that's the beauty of drying out your leaves because the diffusion happens so fast. You've seen it with tea bags, how quickly that happens. Got to tell you this story. A gentleman, 47 years old, asked me over to his land to teach him about his land. And when I went into his house, there were two shelves with jars. And when I first saw them, I thought they were some kind of dried beans. And I got closer and I thought, no, why does this guy have pea gravel in these jars here? <laughs> well, it was his lifetime trophy uh, specimens of stones that he'd had. When he was a little boy of 10 or so, or younger than that, actually, his parents were killed in an automobile accident. And he, his grandparents raised him and they never gave him water. They gave him Coca-Cola. And caffeine is one of the instigators of stone creation. So he made a stone every two months of his life from 10 years old until 47 years old. So the first thing we did was to go out and find Pip Sisawa on his land. And this became hugely important to him. I would imagine that this man was probably just about the world expert on knowing when a stone, stone was forming inside of him. He, I mean, he knew. I mean, think about it. He had a trophy, uh, shelves of it. And so he, you know what he had to do to capture all those, right? So he knew when things were starting up. And the next time that happened for him, he made the tea, he drank a cup in the morning, he drank another cup in the evening. He repeated that the next day and no stone form. Next time it happened, same thing. That was about 18 years ago. That man did not make another stone. So this is a very effective. Was he a Cherokee? Or... No. Well, this goes for anybody that makes a stone. Right. River cane was a hugely important plant to the Cherokee. You know what? I need to show you this first about the tulip tree. I just forgot all about my specimens that I brought. That's the bark. This, this was one rectangular slab of bark cut on a large tulip tree, and it did not kill the tree to do that. The bark can be removed in the springtime only. And while it's still on the tree, let's imagine a, a big trunk right here, and I've cut a large rectangle like that. Figure out where the halfway point is, take a piece of charcoal from my campfire, and draw a very slender football shape right in the middle. Then I score that with my knife, and that's where it bends. So it comes back around to form this lip, which you have to reinforce. I use a strap of hickory branch that I shaved down to two parallel lines. And that serves as kind of like a belt that I laced with the inner bark of hickory, cut off of a green hickory limb. That's all you have to do is cut it off and it's instant rope, it's instant cordage. And that wraps this reinforcement tight against the rip so that I made this uh, 25 something years ago and it's still got a nice oval lip. This is called a berry basket. And what you're seeing inside there is the inner bark still attached. If I put this down into water and soaked it, I could pull that inner bark right off and make cordage out of it. But it makes a very nice liner for the basket too. The tulip tree is also the tree that the Cherokee's dugout canoe was made from. This is a scale model, of course. The real canoe would be about here in the wall to hold lots of people. Useful uh, ferrying people across the stream or perhaps for gathering uh, plants. Some of your best edible plants grow right at the edge of water. And sometimes it's much easier to harvest from the water. And so here's your carrying device too. This is where you put all those things you're gathering. 
These were dug out by hand after building a fire on the log, because once the fire has converted the wood into charcoal, it's much easier to chip out. And that's why it's called a dugout. Yes. How big a tree would you need for a traditional church? If you ever get the chance to go to Joyce Kilmer Forest in North Carolina near Robbinsville, you'll see some of these trees that will amaze you. It takes four and five people to reach around one tree. To make a canoe, it would be this size tree right here. I'm reaching around half of it. So they get quite large. How did they cut those down? With the, originally with what's called a hand axe, literally meaning the cutting tool is in your hand and your arm serves as the half. Wow. So they were chopped out like that. Imagine the hand that did that. <laughs> but it took weeks and weeks to bring a, a tree down like that. You had several people working on it. But it had to be planned, too. You had to know which way it was falling. When it fell, it needed to land on some logs that you had laid out to keep it up off the ground. Then you have to debark it right away, let it dry. And then once it's feasible to burn some of the wood, you start your fire right on top. Often, you'll find a weak place in a tree where the fire tries to go too fast through. So you have to stop the progress of the fire at that point. Can anybody imagine a way that you might stop the fire from continuing on out? The easy solution is mud. Just slap it in there. There's your obstacle that the fire can't get around. OK, now back to the one here. Oh, here's another variation on the basket. It's the exact same idea. See, there's your slender football shape. This is just a real long, thin one made into a quiver. Now, back up to river cane. This is our only native cane in the southeast. It looks very much like bamboo. But the difference is that for a given thickness of a cone of bamboo versus river cane, river cane has longer sections, and river cane has a more severe angle up with its branching than bamboo does. River cane still exist in huge breaks. You ever heard the term cane break? Mm -hmm. And um, some of those are still so thick that it's hard for a, a human to get through. You're looking at a piece of history when you find that because the native people in our area used to burn literally miles a floodplain as a way to manage the forest because the cane lives through that burn because the underground stems called rhizomes are protected and a fire can rage over there and not harm the rhizomes. And then you get back a better crop of river cane. I would say the most common thing made out of river cane would be a mat. What in the world would that be for? What's the good of a mat? Let me just say one word. Chigger. There you go. Baskets. Uh, river cane will be cut into long slits and soaked in water to get them real soft and then woven in, into a, a lacing of basket work. And that was hugely important. You know, we're all so spoiled about containers. Even the containers we carry like this, pockets. And it, look around any room where you are and look at the containers. Look at, that's the main one right there. Look at that brown cardboard box that I brought in. One of the important uses of river cane for the Cherokee, and you know, everything I'm saying about the Cherokee today applies to the Catawba as well. There's a lot of overlap in these tribes that, that were even enemies. The Cherokees and the Catawbas were enemies. The Cherokees and the Creek or Muscogee were enemies but they shared so many commonalities because of the place where they lived. Even going through different zones, you know, the Cherokees were mostly montane and the Creeks were mostly coastal plain, but you get a lot of crossover of plants there in the middle. So they had, they shared a lot of common knowledge that way, but the, uh, that very important arrow shaft was River King. 
for the most part. I know that every young boy, especially, because we're so geared to projectiles, I, I think. When you find your first really nice piece of cane, it just looks so straight and beautiful. That's got to become a spear, right? But when you really look at river cane closely, you know, it's a grass and all grasses grow zigzag. And look down a river cane shaft and you'll see that not only is there a zigzag, but each zig and zag has a slight curve to it. So you've got to straighten all that out. And that's where, remember the very first slide today, the fire? The pyre, that's where fire comes in. That's how you straighten it. So if you had a piece of river cane that zigzag, first you would heat this here by taking it over the coals and turning it. When it gets so hot that you just can't put your fingers on it for long at all, it's ready to take over to the fork in the tree and bend it straight and hold it until it cools. It takes about two minutes to heat it up to that point. It takes one minute at the most to let it cool. It's a fun project in winter. So you take each section first and, and straighten. So then you end up with these very straight zigzags rather than curved zigzags. Then you heat up the joints and straighten those. And you end up with a heat straightened piece of cane that serves as an arrow. The Cherokees had a brilliant solution to repair. Usually when an arrow breaks, I would say about 85% of the time, even today among archers, an arrow breaks right behind the point. That's the most common break. You see how this cane ends right here? And here we have what's called a foreshaft of dogwood. It goes inside the cane and the point is attached to that. If this were to break here, the rest of this does not have to be redone. All that straightening. This comes from the wisdom of having done all this straightening. You know, any Cherokee that has spent time straightening a shaft like that is not going to want to give it up that easily. So this was a great solution to that. Points could be made out of almost anything. Wood, bone, antler, shell, and of course, rock, feathers. These are wing feathers from Turkey. Why feathers on air? What if you shot an arrow with no feathers? What would it do? It would fly. Let me use this since it doesn't have feathers. Shoot an arrow without feathers, and this is what it does. It doesn't have a clue how to go straight. It just tumbles. <laughs> shoot a feather, shoot an arrow with one feather, and it's probably the most dynamic thing of all. It does this. It goes straight for a moment, and then takes a right angle. You could literally shoot around corners. <laughs> But the fascinating thing about feathers to me is, well, let me throw it out as a riddle. Why do we have feathers on the air? And why are they here? Say again? Birds fly. Birds do fly, correct. <laughs> but these are not flapping. They're not even positioned correctly. Does it create momentum? It does just the opposite. It drags. It forces this end of the arrow to be last. Listen to the drag. This end has practically none. Listen to this. Drag. That's the answer. And look at this little brilliant solution. This feather was cut right here. See how it's shorter on this side? And so is this one. And they're put face to face. So there's a kind of asymmetry here causing it to spin. And now you've got the gyroscopic factor, which stabilizes an arrow. Arrow shafts need to have three qualities. Lightness, well, we know how cane is hollow within its sections. It's gotta be flexible. This is, because an arrow when it takes off, first must bend back and forth like that before it finally settles for a smooth trajectory. If it can't bend, it leaps off your bow to one side. It's so frustrating. But a bending arrow takes off perfectly. And the third quality is strength. When this dries, after having cut it, it's just solid shell of wood. It's an excellent arrow shell. 
to tell you the truth, the Cherokee's archery material did not have to be really extraordinary because you can't really take a long shot at something in a thick forest. Something's gonna deflect your arrow, even if it's just a bough of leaves that could ruin your shot. So instead of having magnificent archery equipment, guess what they had instead that was magnificent? The art of stalking. All of the Eastern tribes learned how to move through the forest without being detected by animals peripheral vision. Now, anything looking right at you will see you move. But peripheral vision is interesting. It's motion that draws you to it. For example, I'm looking right there at the back, but I just saw you move your leg, am I right? Right, yep. Peripheral vision, movement just jumps out. And so if you know how to move through peripheral areas without making yourself noticeable, then you won't be looked at. And it's an extremely physical martial art type discipline where your entire body moves through space in ultra slow motion, which means that one step takes two minutes. It's a lot of work and investment in hunting. This is some dead river cane that really shows off that angle of the branching I mentioned, how more vertical it is. I probably had the most dramatic results with medicines from the red maples, wonderful gift of a burn medication. I've had so many people in my classes who are camping there overnight, burn themselves. Many folks aren't accustomed to working around open fire. I remember one night, a young man was just not thinking, you know, he's so used to being at home and picking up his saucepan and moving it over. He picked up a hot handle and burned his hand terribly. And we made this medicine up. I'm gonna tell you how to do it in just a moment. But as soon as he put his hand in there, every bit of pain was gone. This has been the case every time I've used it with someone, it brings immediate relief. It turns tears into smiles and it does three beautiful things. Number one, it stops the pain. Number two, it stimulates the unburned cells at the border of your wound to start proliferating cells. So it literally cranks up the healing process. Number three, it leaves a film over the wound. And that's your advantage. That keeps secondary infection from getting in. Easy to make. Take any container that will hold water and just fill it with maple, red maple leaves only, no water, just the leaves. It doesn't matter if it's a little saucepan or a 55 gallon drum or whatever you might need it for. Boil water separately and then pour that water over your leaves and then get that blunt ended tool again and crush, 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 crush until that water is cool. That's a good long time of work. But you've got to get all that work in to get the chemicals out. Now, if your burn part of your body can't get into your container, like the young man who burned his hand, Terry, then just get a cloth and put it in there, wring it out a little bit, and bring that to your burn and put it on. Got to tell you this story. A physician came to one of my classes. And after the class was over, he came to me and said, I have a, a patient I've been working on for three months. At his workplace, he leaned on hot machinery and he burned his chest horribly, about the size of a soccer ball. And he'd been working on him for those three months and reduced that festering wound to softball size. And that was all he could do. It, it still maintained its festering and painful wound there. So he said, I'm gonna go home and make this up. We're gonna give it a try. He called me nine days later, the wound was gone. I've had personal experience with this myself and have never been let down by it. Sassafras is a beautiful word in itself. Another Algonquin word. It means green twig. Uh, maybe we can just, probably not in this photo, not, not that visible, but 
take a look at the outer branches of sassafras trees right now, you know the growing season's over. That was over way back in June, unless the tree had some unusual thing happen to it. But those branches are still green out toward the end. This tree has been known for centuries by some of our ancestors as being a wonderful yearly tonic to use in the spring, but nobody understood how or why it worked the way it did. Basically, if you ask somebody, why do you do that? They would say it's to be healthy, to be healthier, to fight off disease, but nobody really knew how it worked. Now we do. Sassafras has in it a compound that we call saffron. We find that in black pepper. It is mildly carcinogenic. If taken in big quantities, could be a problem for somebody. But all of us here use black pepper, right? There's no threat about cancer from that because we use such small amounts. You know, cancer is largely about moderation or lack of in many, many situations. Well, in a laboratory, experiment, the Surgeon General back in the, I guess it was back in the 70s, Surgeon General Coop was experimenting with everything in our culture to see what was carcinogenic. That was the year that it came out that the gristle at the edge of hamburgers is carcinogenic. That didn't last very long in the news. <laughs> uh, sassafras was a victim to that study. What they did was they isolated sephrol from the roots injected that lone chemical into a laboratory rat until it made a tumor. The amount put into that rat was absurd. So sassafras tea is helpful to us because it does have that slight carcinogenic quality, which boosts our immune system. It gets your immune system awakened to be ready for the spring, say, hay fever months. The best news about this tree for me is that we now have a ready cure for food poisoning and water poisoning, dysentery. When you've eaten something bad or drunk bad water, this is the tree that could literally save your life. Because usually when somebody drinks bad water, they were desperate. And when they get sick from that, they're dehydrated with diarrhea and they need more water. They're gonna get more of the bad water. So this is a really important medicine for the so-called survival section of all these thoughts. One cup of sassafras root tea is all you need to kill all the bacteria in your gut, good and bad. Sometimes we have to do that. There's nothing that we know that can go in and be selective about getting the bad bacteria. So we just have to start over with bacteria, but it's worth it because when you get bad food or bad water, you can be literally incapacitated physically. You can't do the jobs you need to do. Easy to make. Take any amount of root. It doesn't matter the size. Clean it off. Put some little slits in it with your knife in an empty cup. Drop your root in. When you see the water has turned pink, get some forceps and remove the root. Wrap it up, use it again another time. That's your tea. When it is turned pink, it's ready. There's no detailed attention to dosaging here. It's just when it turns pink. And I know from personal use, it will take you from being down on your back and miserable to normal in 45 minutes. Yes. When you live outside, you're doing it all the time because your hands are dirty. You know, that's part of life. It's a good thing for children to be down on all fours. That's the way we get a lot of the bacteria that we need. The wonder plant that cures all itches, cures uh, inflammations of the skin, it cures poison ivy rash. It makes a chigger bite stop itching immediately. And it starts the healing process. Chemical inside of this that has been found recently is called Lawson. I don't believe this is the chemical that creates 
the the remedy, however, I think there's more to be learned about what's in dual weed. Inside of it is a mucilage in every part of it, leaves, stalks, stem, roots. That mucilage is the medicine. You simply crush it and apply it right onto the skin problem. It works like cortisone, but it's natural and it doesn't have the problems associated with it that cortisone does. You had a question. Well, what was it to have where poison ivy is in two weeks of poison ivy so nearly there? I know that's often said, but it's not true. You'll find there, anytime you try to make a rule in nature like that, prepare to be humbled. I've been humbled many times that way. Everybody likes to have little pat rules, but you cannot depend on that. How do you use it? You just take the leaves and put it on. You can them? crush any part of any part of the plant and apply it topically only. You can't save jewel weed medicine except by freezing it. And I know that a lot of people claim they have done it in salads or whatever, but in my opinion, freezing is the only way to do it. So that means bringing the whole plant with dirt home, put it in a blender with water, freeze it in an ice tray, and you can use those cubes throughout any time of the year. But it's an amazing cure. Research has covered this. Uh, experiments were done with a control group. Jewelweed applications three times a day will cure a poison ivy rash in two to three days. Poison ivy rash generally runs out. It's uh, expected to last on me for about two weeks. Two to three days. Cure. This is not native but it's everywhere. This the native people call white man's foot because the first place that they encountered this was on all the trails between the colonies. And why? Because those seeds that you see there prefer hard packed soil. And so a trail offers just that. And these seeds were brought from the old world and most of them were probably brought in the hulls of ships, ships which used dirt as ballast to brave the Atlantic Sea. And once they got over here, if a, if a ship needed repair, first thing to do before dry docking it is shovel out all that dirt. That's the way a lot of plants got here from Europe, England, wherever. Broadleaf plantain, is one of the plantains that we can really depend on to work as a poultice. It literally draws out insect venom. So you can count on this to work subcutaneously, but not intramuscularly. You could not expect this to help you with a snake bite, but you could expect it to help you with the inflammation of a snake bite. By rubbing this leaf, crushing it or chewing it, because it is a wild edible, it's a very good salad green. You could chew it into a mass and apply it right on the sting and it will draw the venom out. You know why a sting hurts so much? It's not the puncture. That's not really much. I mean, if you imagine taking a straight pin and just giving yourself a little stab, sure, it hurts for a moment, but then it's over, right? It's the acid that's pumped into you. This brings it out and this works. This plant never grows a stem with leaves coming off of the stem. It's called a basal rosette, meaning that all the leaves come from the top of the root. You'll know you have the correct plant if you take the leaf in one hand and the leaf stalk in another, and very, very patiently, maybe more patiently than you've ever done anything, break the two apart and you'll see strings inside that will last. And it almost looks like a little miniature guitar as you're pulling them out. You can pull the veins right out of the leaves. Notice they have parallel veins. That's our oldest type of veination. So you know that's a very old type of plant. Yes? Well, this and the dual weed, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot of people, fire, do they work for it? Yes, they do. Let me, I'm going to close with this because I know that I'm going over time, but I was once visiting a school, grammar school. We went out in the back and I, I taught the children about 
the different medicines that were out there that they could literally use when they needed to. Always choose very safe things, things that can be used topically, things that have no uh, chance of misidentifying because of real obvious traits. And one of them was this, when they saw me break that leaf apart and saw those veins, I know all of them couldn't wait to try that on their own. Medicine. And that's a great way to, to verify that that's the correct plant. Well, the whole time I'm teaching them this, I noticed their teacher was just over there completely uninvolved. You know, thinking about something else, not watching anything I was doing. And suddenly we heard her chirp. She was standing in fire ants. Oh. And she said, oh, I've got to get back. And she started running back. And the kids said, wait, wait. <laughs> the kids taught her. They brought her back to the plant. So we fixed her up. Everybody held a little piece of leaf, chewed up leaf through each one of her bites, you know. And it was so funny because there she was throughout the whole time. And she missed the whole lesson. And she was the one who needed it. <laughs> but it works beautifully. And what I think is so valuable about using this is because so often when people are stung or bitten, the first thing is to want to rescue, rush that child inside. The medicine cabinet becomes the magic box. You know, What if that magical response to the unpleasant thing came from nature? That's a different day in that child's life. Instead of nature being the enemy, nature is a place where you've got to watch what you're doing, but you've got friends out there. And I mean it when I say that that plant becomes a friend to you once you've used it. And you'll recognize it everywhere you go after that. I have a series of books that I've written based on my career of teaching Cherokee survival skills that are all over on that table for you to have a look at. They're divided up into their various subject matters. I'll just let you see those as you come across them. But you'll take note that book one is all about plants because that is the foundation. Learn about plants of an area, you have a huge head start in everything else, such as fire making or bow and arrow making, or whatever it is, even in tracking. By being familiar with plants, you know when a plant is disturbed. That's part of tracking. So take a look at those and you might find something that could be useful in your life because I've written it for three different kinds of people. I first wrote it for the person who simply wants to learn how to do these things, how to make these things, how to make fire, how to know a, a gray fox track from a red fox track, that kind of thing. I've also written it for those people who work in nature centers, who just want more, you know, so that they can teach it. Park rangers, uh, scout leaders. We have a lot of well-intentioned scout leaders who know nothing about nature. That's a fact. And I'm not being condescending when I say that. It's just the way it is. It's for those people too. And last is for the parent and the grandparent. If you want your child, and I'm betting everybody in this room does because you've come to a nature center. You want your child to understand that world of nature and to get out and have some adventure with it. Every one of those books has hundreds of original activities geared for that. Make sure your child has fun in the early days of being in nature so that, that child will want to go back. I have one part of a book in there all on games that are played outside because I believe in having fun out there. Then they want to return. Only when they return and they want to return will they gain a relationship with something and then, like that, and only then will they want to conserve it. That's the only way people are going to care about things is if they first have a reason to. Anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, is the Cherokee? It's got cyanide. In it. So unless they remove the cyanide, well, you know, so does black cherry seed. But they, they took the endosperm out of that and served it as a portion of a meal after they removed the cyanide. So chances are very good because, you know, there are a thousand species of bamboo. So it's very hard to just speak about bamboo in general. 
because there's so many different ones. Some of them don't have hollow sections. Right, right. But what I'm saying is they're related, okay? Many bamboos you can eat right from the, as they, after they shoot up into sprouts and they're edible raw, but some have to be cooked first. And, and think about it, a thousand species. What kind of knowledge would that be to know how to deal with those species? So it's saying a lot, but so the answer to your question is, it could be only if treated first. Yes, sir. You run across the use of native shrub called leatherwood, burnt up the leather. Mm -hmm. Tie as a tie knot tie. You sure can. You can tie a knot with a branch. It's pretty fascinating. Is that, is that strong enough to tie a basket together like that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but this sea is made of just bark. What you're talking about is. Oh, <laughs> there was a question online about um, the red maple leaves when you usually use them fresh or dried. Fresh. Fresh. Uh, I should repeat that. The question uh, that was sent online was Are you using fresh maple leaves? And the answer to that is yes. Right. To, be, to gather up dead leaves of anything is pretty much uh, an exercise in futility. There's not much left in dead leaves. When you dry dead leaves purposely, that's a very different thing. But especially when exposed to sunlight, even on a forest floor, the chemicals that were once an integral part of that leaf are, have been dissipated by that point. Any other questions before we close up? Did you chew the red maple leaf? I can't remember. No, the, the question was, did you chew the red maple leaf? No, that was the one that we put in a, some container and added just boiled water and crushed it and crushed it to use when it was cool on a burn. You had a question. How did you learn so much about this place? I was born with a love of the forest. I don't know where it came from because my family did not enjoy that. Really. So I was a little odd to them probably, but my mom was great and she allowed me that freedom to be in the forest. And in the early years, it was just an aesthetic thing. To me i didn't know what i was seeing i would see a track and just guess at it you know and i didn't know the names of plants and it was that way for a long time in a way it was like when i was in the forest i felt like i was watching me in my favorite movie <laughs> you know i was just being in a, in a masterpiece and then about the time i got into my mid-career of college i just suddenly wanted to know it all and that's when i started learning the details. I was already in the sciences by that time. I finished up with chemistry, but uh, that direction was pre-med, but I just couldn't do that because uh, I needed to have this outdoor aspect to my life. Uh, and so from that point, I would go to nature center programs. I would be the guy right up front there at plant walks asking all the questions, you know, just hungry for it because in a sense, I already knew all the, the pieces in some way, and now I was getting to know them really personally. And then, uh, and eventually it came to, to my adult life where I th think that the greatest adventure in the world uh, of all the fun things that I've done, in canoeing, or whatever, rock climbing or backpacking or whatever, the greatest adventure is just to go out into the woods and be there and live with it and to know what I can use. It's just an adventure. And the irony is that was the way it was for everybody. And now it's become pretty much esoteric. Okay, uh, we did bring my other books here just in case somebody might be interested. So let me just quickly tell you about those. Uh, I did a memoir of the two years that I lived in a, in a teepee. And that was in the mountains of North Georgia. So a Plains Indian teepee in the mountains of Georgia. Yeah. Still a great, great two years, great adventure. And, you know, Annie Dillard said, if you want to get to go get to know nature, you got to get in its way. <laughs> and that's where I was in the teepee. I can't tell you how many. Well, I can tell you. I wrote a book about it. <laughs> but I had so many intersections with animals that just would not have happened, including inside my teepee. Uh, I've written a trilogy on the life of 
America's probably most famous peace officer from the Old West, simply because it was an interest of mine all my life. Wyatt Earp, a, a man whom most young people today don't even know who he is, but uh, that trilogy had to be because I spent uh, 67 years researching him. And I have uh, two new novels out. Basically, I am a novelist. So this is, this is the route I'm heading. I've, I think I've done my nonfiction things and now I want to do more novels. But my first two are over there. Indigo Heaven takes place in Wyoming in 1870s. It's a Western. And Song of the Horseman is an Eastern. It's about a Cherokee horse trainer and his grandson, their two parallel lives running side by side, separate stories and then coalescing. So have a look and thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was fabulous. We, we really enjoyed that. Um, this is the book that he mentioned um, that is, I think from what I understand, has the most about native plants and would probably be our starter book. Um, and it is available here today uh, for purchase, but also in bookstores and online. So uh, if you're interested. Uh, one note I wanted to make, um, Mark is that, as you mentioned, the Catawba is, is the Native American tribe that is most common in our area. And in Rock Hill, there, uh, one of the Carolina Thread Trails is called the Catawba Indian Nation Greenway Trail. And um, it's, it's not completely kept up, but they have some interpretive signage and um, you do get to walk along the Catawba River. Um, I think the the visitor center might be in a little bit of transition. When I was there about six months ago, it was closed, but the trail is still there and the signage is still there. So if you'd like to, it, and it mentions a lot of the plants that you did um, with some really nice signage. So if you're interested in that, it's a great place to visit. Um, thank you all. And um, I just need to mention all of you, intrepid explorers who came to us from shelter three because we had a little bit of a miscommunication and we apologize for that but we're so glad you're all with us today and we're going to sign off of the zoom now